Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so you know what that means. It's time for another midweek mini mail call. This is gonna be number 54, which kind of blows my mind, and I still have quite a few more to come in the future. Lots of stuff that hasn't been shown yet on the channel. Also, before I get started, I wanna apologize for the background noise in this video, at least during the bench parts. We're having a bit of a heat wave in Portland, and my air conditioning has been running nonstop to really keep my house livable and cool. So I apologize for the background noise. So without further ado, let's get right start. <laughs> let's like, <laughs> let's get right. <laughs> what is going on? Let's get, <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I lost it. Okay, is this gonna be an outtake? Let's get right to it. Ooh, it's hot down here. The studio lights, even though they're LEDs, they really heat up the room, which is interesting because I can't imagine in the old days when you were working under cameras and heavy high, bright lights and stuff, it must have been so hot, so, so hot. All right, we have a package from Mike in Ottawa. So that's the capital city of Canada. Hi to all my Canadian viewers. My father lived in Ottawa for a number of years. So I used to visit him there, so I know that city pretty well. Ooh, this is one of those packing things for hard drives, but no hard drive in there. Oh, oh look at this. <laughs> oh, Mike, ketchup potato chips, which are amazing. I am Canadian, therefore I love ketchup potato chips. I think, I love ketchup and I love dill pickle as well. They're both really, really good. But a lot of people in the US think, ooh, ketchup, that sounds weird. But why? Ketchup, french fries, potatoes, amazing. Why wouldn't it be good on a bag of chips? They're actually not too crushed as well. So thank you very much for that. We have a letter. We have something here. It looks like some processors maybe. I've got an Atari joystick. And that is it. Okay, let's go into this letter here from Mike. Oh, all right, okay, this is from Mike who actually has sent something into the channel before. He goes, hey, Adrian, it's one of your videos you mentioned one of your favorite flavors of chips is ketchup. There it is. Since it's unavailable in the US, I sent you some. He sent me some other kinds of chips. Yeah, that's in here. We'll take a look at that in a sec. Just don't eat them. I hope you find some use for these and keep up the awesome videos. He's also included an Atari controller to go with the VCS he sent me last time. It's kind of chewed up, but it does work. So yes, thank you very much for the joystick. Oh yeah, so let's see what's in the here. What's in the bag of chips? The non-edible chips. These came all the way from my home country of Canada. Let's see what these are. They look like Intel chips of some kind. Ah, oh, they are indeed. Hey, there's a DX4100 here. Okay, really cool. And an SX in a PGA form factor. So let's take a quick look at these on the bench. All right, a joystick, some processors, but more importantly, some ketchup potato chips. I know Americans watching might go, what, ketchup potato chips? But I mean, Think about it. Potatoes, ketchup, they go together. You put ketchup on your French fries, which are fried potatoes, and what are chips? But just thinly sliced fried potatoes. So ketchup chips are everywhere in Canada. They're amazing. I think they're amazing. And that's not just because I'm Canadian. I love ketchup, I love potatoes. It's a great combo. But more importantly, why can't you buy these in the US? It just makes no sense to me. Now this is Lay's brand, which is a super common brand in the US here, but uh, also in Canada. They have all the other varieties in ketchup as well. You can get Pringles and all the store brands and all the other brands of chips all come in ketchup. So it's family size, made in Canada. Yes, I mean, the irony if they were made in the US, it would be super insulting. 
but they're made in Canada. Probably most of the potato chips we buy in the US are probably made in Canada. And just in case you haven't been to Canada before, in Canada, the national language is English and French, which means that all products that are sold in stores need to have both languages on it. So because of that, you have English and French on everything, everywhere. So let me give these chips a quick taste test. I mean, I've had them a million times. I know what they taste like, but just to show everyone on camera here, yeah, they're kind of a reddish color, but oh, they're so good. If you wanna know what these sort of taste like, imagine a salt and vinegar chip with a bit of ketchup flavor added. That's what it's like, a little bit of a sweetness from the ketchup with the salty and the vinegar taste mixed together. Of course, um, the different brands have slightly different tastes. I personally prefer the old Dutch version of these, which you can get in Western Canada. So when I go visit family up in uh, British Columbia, I always bring back a whole bunch. But Lay's, they're ubiquitous across the entire country of Canada. Pretty good, I like them. And Mike, thank you very much for sending these all the way from Ottawa. I think you sent them months and months ago, but they are still crunchy and delicious. They're salty, they're fatty, they're hard to resist. I mean, they're designed as junk food to keep you hooked, right, and eating more. Okay, anyways, let me put these away. Okay, 2600 joystick. What is there to say about these? Not much. Um, very historical. <laughs> Hurt your hand. I mean, a lot of kids have played a billion hours of games on these. I never particularly loved them, although the original ones are certainly better quality than those Atari flashback ones, which are extra junky. This one has, well, it suffered a little bit of road rash or something. <laughs> what happened here exactly? I can't say. Either someone started chewing on it or it got dragged down the road maybe by its cord <sighs> like this. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I'm sure this joystick works fine uh, because they are reliable. The only thing that starts to happen is this rubber boot starts to crack and then this part slides off. Oh yeah, and I remember this is Mike's channel here, the new retro show. I'll put a link to his YouTube channel down below so you can check that out. Mike previously had sent me an Atari 2600 that wasn't working and it had a problem with the composite mod, which I fixed, and uh, it's uh, still a nice working 2600. All right, so here are those processors. So we have a little assortment here, 46DX266 pretty much arguably one of the best Intel 46 processors of all times. Super popular, lots of people had them. I remember I had one and absolutely loved that processor. It was just nice and fast. Plus I think I had upgraded from some slower version of the 46 and uh, it was a very speedy and good upgrade. Now here's its cousin here, the 46DX33. Really the big difference between these two, I mean, there might be some other difference that I don't mention here, but this one runs at a bus speed of 33 megahertz and an internal speed of 33 megahertz. This one runs at a bus speed of 33 megahertz as well, but a clock doubled internal speed of 66. There were some 46 processors that ran at a bus speed of 50 megahertz, but at that time, that was actually really pushing the envelope and you had some stability issues. For, so for the best performance and stability, this was one of the best Intel processors, at least. Later, there were like DX4s and stuff that still ran at a bus speed of 33 megahertz. They were stable as well, but that, that just came out further down the road. And then we have here, one of the crappiest 46s of all, 46SX25. Basically, they took the DX, disabled the Mathco processor, and then they only ran at slow speeds. And typically, these were built into the motherboard like that compact Presario I had. I think it had a 25 megahertz, but it was like a quad flat pack SMD part. And to upgrade that any better, you had to put an entire new processor on the board in the math coprocessor slot, but it wasn't really a math coprocessor. It was an entire separate brand new processor. Intel never made an external math coprocessor for it at 46. You basically put like this, this chip in, which had the math coprocessor built in, or this one as well.
And then this processor came out a little bit later. Of course, it's an AMD, and it is a DX4100. So yes, 100 megahertz, nice and speedy. Now, while this has the same exact pinout and socket as the rest of these chips, the problem with these later ones is they required, well, they required a heat sink, so that's not a huge problem, but they did require a heat sink while these other ones didn't. But the other thing is they also ran on three volts or 3.3 volts. These are five volt parts. So if you have an old motherboard like that Compaq Persario, I can't just stick this chip in there. It's really designed to work with one of these old five megahertz parts or five volt parts, I'm sorry. And it doesn't just work with these. The Intel Overdrive, like the one that's in there now that LGR sent me, that has a voltage regulator built into like, well, it's stuck on the top of the processor to convert down to the lower voltage needed for the high speed. So if you have a slower, older 486, you can just drop in this and pretty much be assured this DX266 will work. Not so much so with these. You need to have special jumpers and configure it as such to, uh, to run at that higher speed with the lower voltage. I don't know what happens if you stick this into a machine that's five volts only, probably kills it. So really that's why I think that the DX266 is one of the best 486s because it's pretty much universally compatible to work in everything and doesn't require a fancy motherboard with uh, the three volt support. Now, speaking of the Compact Presario, I actually have right here the 46 DX266 that I was running in there before I did the overdrive. And I did just kind of stick this heat sink on with some adhesive tape, thermal adhesive tape. So I, I need to unstick this. I just, it's been sitting over on the side of my bench since I made that video. Uh, but it's always nice to have a couple extra of these 486s around because if I end up with a, another 486 machine, I can just pop in the DX266 or try some other combinations here for performance testings, kind of like CPU Galaxy. He's got an incredible CPU collection and does all that awesome testing, like overclocking the 486 to some insane speed to get like the fastest 46 speed records of all time. I'm still going on about the 66 megahertz chip here. I mean, what's so cool about this is if you think back to 1984, when the original 5170 came out, it wasn't only about, let's see if there's a day code on here, 1994 right there, seventh week, or I don't know, that could also be July, but whatever. This chip basically came out about 10 years later from that 286 based IBM. And the speed difference between the 286 at six megahertz to this at 66 megahertz, it's more than just 10 times faster, like by, you know, multiplying the megahertz by 10. This thing has pipeline optimization and branch, branch prediction and all those extra features that make it so unbelievably fast. I mean, processor performance these days, it's stagnant. All they do is they throw more cores at it. But when you look at the core speed, on like a current 2021 processor versus one from 2011. Yeah, it's a bit faster, but it's not like orders of magnitude faster. And that's what was going on in the old days, which was one of the things that was so cool about that era is just the performance leaps that were happening were just staggering. And honestly, going from a 4666 like this to a Pentium, even a 133, double the clock speed, the performance leap again, it was insane, it was massive. That was just such an incredible time when processor upgrades really, really gave you such a huge boost to performance. And just to kind of drive home the point about performance these days, my bench computer, the one I'm using in front of me here, it's got a first generation Core i7 processor in it. It's quad core, it came out in 2009, I think. It's completely 100% totally usable with Windows 10. I honestly don't have any problems with it just doing web browsing. I mean, I'm sure if I'm compiling huge programs or whatever, it's a bit slow, but even looking at 3D models for the 3D printer and doing slicing, all that stuff works perfectly fine. If you tried to run programs that really were designed to work on this 46 on an original six megahertz AT from 10 years earlier, you'd be dead in the water. It either wouldn't run at all, 
because it's not even a 32-bit processor, or it'd be so slow, it'd be completely, completely unusable. Anyhow, I think I've talked enough about that. Mike, thanks very much for setting this stuff in. I will enjoy those chips. And here's a package. This is actually going to be an unpacking from this angle. I apologize for not doing my normal uh, camera angle. I just, uh, there's stuff on the bench behind me there. So I'm just gonna do it here. This package, which obviously comes from Amazon, is from one of my patrons named Paxton. He thought my tool set that I was using was a little inadequate. So he wanted to send me something that might help me out. I think specifically he was talking about this tool set that I'm using. This was something that was in like a little case with little, um, held all the bits and it broke. It was from AliExpress and it was really cheap and crappy. So unfortunately um, I use this. Oh, and I have this one as well which is just a whole bunch of bits and stuff. Um, this works, you know, um, I have a little nut driver around that I'll break out to use with this. But overall, um, I don't know, this set, I've had this for a long time and it's not ideal. It doesn't have any of the really small sizes, which is why I got this junky set, but these two sets are kind of cruddy. So I think this is gonna be something along those lines. Oh, wow. <laughs> It's wrapped. <laughs> that almost surprises me when Amazon wraps stuff like this. I know it's an optional thing you can do, but it's uh, pretty hilarious. Let's see what this note says here. I hope this finds you well, and I hope you find this useful. Thank you for all your great videos from Paxton. That is cool. Amazon <laughs> taking over the world. And they even put the invoice uh, face down so you don't accidentally see what was just sent to you. All right, well, something in here that's a decent size. It's funny because it's not like it's wrapped with paper, it's, you know, it's a sack. But the good thing is, it, it is a reusable sack. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can re-gift something in it later. Oh, and there it is. Oh, look at that. The ProTech Toolkit from iFixit. Now, it seems like every YouTube channel under the sun is sponsored or has ads from iFixit. Not me, um, <laughs> they've never reached out to me, which is fine, because I don't really you know, do sponsorships or anything like that. But Paxton went out and purchased this for me. Why am I struggling here to open this? There must be some tape on it. Ah, there is. So he went and bought this from Amazon, had this sent to me, which was so incredibly generous of him. He's already a patron and already supporting me through his uh, wonderful donations, but he wanted to help me out from a tool perspective. Now, I've just heard so many good things about iFixit. The ProTech Toolkit Owner's Guide. All right, some stickers and a really nice case. Oh, this is, this is awesome. This is really cool. So several viewers have sent in some tools before, like spudgers and tweezers and things like that. In fact, uh, if I reach over here, here's a set of some tweezers. But unfortunately, um, I mean, I don't know if the iFixit ones are better than these. These are like AliExpress style ones. Uh, I've already had at least one of these sets go bad. You know, the little tips are bent and no good. I mean, I suppose they're sort of disposable, but I would hope that the ones that come from iFixit you know, they, they work with suppliers to make the tools and actually, yeah, immediately it, it feels, it feels a lot stronger. Like, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but just squeezing on it, it feels sturdy. Like it doesn't bend as much when you, when it comes together. These ones on the other hand, they just, they feel kind of flimsy. I mean, they work, they definitely work. When the tips start to get bent though, the problem is when you go to pick up really fine things, you can't, like little tiny resistors or whatever, they, they go flying across the room. But yeah, these feel really nice. Now they're super sharp, which is why you have the little cap here. These are a little set of grabbers that you can grab things without having to hold onto it. So it it actually holds it, well, not, not so great that one, but holds that. We have another regular set of straight tweezers. They feel really nice, very clicky, a lot better than the ones that crapped out, they were just like that. They look like that, the ones that died. We have like a, what is this, like a pick tool and a little spludger, spudger thing. 
and I think iFixit, they just, they use really good quality plastics. Now, I definitely have some of these tools that people have sent me. Oh, this is a cool one. It's got like a hook thing going on. I'm trying to have a plastic blade there. I like it. And this as well. I mean, I have, I have versions of all of these tools already, but they're all kind of cheap and not good quality. And here's a spudger that actually has a really nice molded handle on it. I'm totally digging it. Here's an example of one of the typical ones that you get from China, and they work. I have certainly used these. They bend really easily and they, they get damaged. So I'm imagining that this is maybe a better spring steel. So besides those, there's a bunch of picks here. They look like guitar picks kind of thing. So this is good if you're taking a screen off something. I haven't done a screen replacement ever actually on a phone, but I figure one day I'll need to do that, but you sort of pry it up. In fact, here's the iFixit um, suction cup. You use this suction cup to lift the screen. So you, after you heat the adhesive, you lift up with this and even has a nice thing for your finger here. And you get these under the screen. If you've watched Jerry Riggs Everything or Jerry Rig Everything channel, he, uh, he takes a lot of phones apart. And he's really, really good at it. So these are all sort of tools of the trade of that kind of stuff. Although I really just see him using razor blades and the suction cup. But for mere mortals like me, I need to use these plastic tools. I think in this pocket, something that was, uh, is kind of a joke for me to use. Um, it's a anti-static strap. I mean, has anyone ever seen me use one of these ever? No, I don't. I would like to get an anti-static mat for the bench. I really would. So if anyone has recommendations, please let me know. Plus it would cover up all this damage that happened on the bench here, which by the way happened. Um, this here is the bottom of an 18 amp hour gel cell 12 volt battery, which I left charging and overnight it decided to dump its guts. So it, it sealed lead acid. Well, it wasn't so sealed anymore and it messed up my desk, which is what this is. It happened many years ago, but this is like the, uh, <laughs> the stains. But if I got an anti-static mat, I would use it. And I'm sure I would ground it, but wearing one of these, I know a lot of people think that I damage tons of things by not wearing these, but look, I've been doing this kind of work now for 20, 30 years and I haven't ever had a problem. And not to say it can't happen, I'm not saying that static is not an issue or can't be an issue, but in Oregon here in my basement, humidity, well, even right now it's 52%. All right, so look, here's the tool set and I think I absolutely love it. It's held on by magnets. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> that is really cool. I really dig that. It's strong enough that it won't go flying out. And once you wrap this up, it'll hold onto it. So yeah, there's the tool set. And the lid also held on by magnets, kick ass. And there are the tools and they are so nice. Look at that compared to this junk, this junk. Oh, I love it. This is a flexible. So I guess you can go on the, the, the driver that way and you can kind of get around corners and stuff. And it's got a nice spinny top. It feels very nice. This has a spinny top as well, but it's so, it's all plastic. This is like anodized aluminum. It feels really nice. All sorts of tips there for various nuts. Like I think the IBM 5170 screws, I have one right here, fits into one of these, I would imagine. There, that one right there perfect fit into that one there. That, that's awesome. And this is all padded, it's foam. Just the whole thing feels really, really nice. Paxton, this is absolutely great. This junky set here, which this is not the original box, obviously. This will get relegated to when something in here breaks. If I ever break it, I can maybe grab a bit out of this junky set, but this is, oh. Yeah, no, I mean, this is this is just great. I just love it, like security bits. I think the thing that excites me the most about this toolkit too, is that the foam is holding on to the bits so that they don't fall out. Cause that was the problem with that other tool set is it was plastic and one day I tilted over and they, and then I just put them back in random positions. And actually 
that happened with this red tool set too. It's just plastic, so the bits aren't really held on properly. Oh, I guess this is for Nintendo cartridges. That's interesting. And these are triangular bits? I'm sorry, I'm just geeking out at these. These are really cool. Oh, and there's a magnet. <laughs> I love it, I love it. A magnet. That doesn't stick on that, that must be aluminum. There we go. <laughs> that is super handy, especially with the, um, the rubber thing there. <laughs> okay, anyhow, okay, I think everyone has seen one of these tool sets enough times. Um, personally, I have not. I have never been up close and personal with an iFixit tool set, but I am very impressed. And this whole thing, as it just folds together so nicely, will be so nice to use. So Paxton, thank you very much for this generous donation. I really do appreciate it. All right, we have a package here from New Zealand. This might be my first package from New Zealand. It comes from Shane in Upper Hutt. I work with some people for my day job who are in our New Zealand office. And of course I've been chatting with them during the human malware stuff. And New Zealand has done an incredible job at keeping coronavirus out of the country. So life is pretty much normal for them and has been for a long time. And I gotta say, whenever I talk to them on Zoom meeting, I feel slightly envious same thing for Western Australia. <laughs> um, but Shane, Shane has gone and sent me the mother loaves of, of New Zealand sweets. What? <laughs> this is incredible. Wow, Ghana peppermint, dark almonds. So we got some chocolates. We have some potato chips or crisps. Okay, Bluebird, Big Night In, garlic bread flavor. Wow. We have some Perky Nana. <laughs> Never heard of that. It's from Cadbury. Pixie Caramel from Nestle. Um, something here that's wrapped up. There is a letter. Jaffa's. Oh, this is amazing. Shane, I haven't. Uh, this is all stuff I have, of course, not had before. Rainbow Classic pineapple chunks. And then we have Pascal milk bottles. <laughs> and then the odd, the last thing in here is Sour Patch Kids Max Sour. So uh, yeah, this stuff you can buy in the US, this particular one. In fact, who makes this anyways? Oh yeah, it's made by Mondelez, which is craft food basically. So um, that's why that, that, that one's available here. But this is amazing. All right, so let's check out the letter from Shane. Hello from New Zealand. Oh, Kalu Kale, oh, joyful day. Adrian's unboxing my stuff, hooray. Okay, this is written in prose. Just decided to become one of your many enablers. <laughs> Please enjoy some confectionery favorites us Kiwis love. Although I'm not a fan of milk bottles, that maybe you are. I probably will like these. I like those Harry bows with the white stuff on there and that's like a milk thing. Plus something electronic that may be put to some use with a question mark. Please apologize to Rami. I have nothing for him, but as I understand it, he is on a diet. <laughs> just so, just to refresh everyone's memory. <laughs> Just to refresh everyone's memory on Rami here. This was sent in by a viewer, an Australian viewer, I might add. So a neighbor, so to speak, of Shane's, I mean, there's water in between, but you know, it's the same part of the world in the Southern hemisphere there. So Rami is Australian. And um, now I have some sweets from New Zealand and Shane apologizes for not being able to feed Rami. Although Rami has this wonderful dead parts bin right here with Rami's face on it now. So Rami's immortalized in a box. Anyhow, um, my packaging capabilities are not as good as some I have seen. However, sugar is resilient. And you know what? This bag of crisps here, they don't feel all broken and there's still air. They're, they're not, they're in one piece. Survived probably an airplane ride and all that stuff. So let's see what's in um, this little wrapped up package. The, the one non-sugar carbohydrate overload thing here. All right, looks like we have some adapter cards for laptops. What is this one? This is some kind of a wireless adapter, 16-bit PCMCIA. Oh, 10100 Ethernet. 
That's handy. We have an IBM 3270 emulation card and a Firewire card bus adapter card. So card bus is PCI in this form factor. And this also has a dongle that's missing, but that's kind of cool. I think I'm gonna put this entire video from Shane on my second channel since it's mostly food related here. And I will add that I've never been to New Zealand, so I've never tried any of these except for the Sour Patch Kids. And I have been to Australia, so I've tried a few Australian delicacies like Tim Tams and Vegemite, which is thumbs down if you ask me. I don't, don't like that at all, but I know that's, that has nothing to do with New Zealand. So I will be very curious to see how these wonderful looking things taste. So there's gonna be a little quick break while I finish unboxing everything else from Mail Call, and then I get back to this food. Just a quick look at the stuff that Shane sent. So this card here is kind of a cool one. I like this, 10100 ethernet card. But what's cool is obviously it doesn't use a dongle. You can just plug the cable straight into it. So that's uh, pretty handy actually. I can't remember if I actually have any cards like this at all. I think I, I only have dongle based ones. And there have been some Wi-Fi cards sent in on mail call recently, but I gotta say those just don't seem to work well on my network. Um, even the ones that support more advanced WPA or sorry, WEP. Uh, so I do prefer to stick to ethernet, especially cause if I just reach over here on my bench, for instance, you know, I have an ethernet cable. I, I always have ethernet cables hooked up to switches at hand, pretty much everywhere in the basement. So Wi-Fi is not really necessary, but quick and easy to use ethernet. That on the other hand is definitely good. And then here's a Belkin Firewire card bus adapter. Now it does say uh, dash Mac. I'm wondering if this one is specifically for Macintoshes. Unfortunately though, yep, it's a dongle based one. And um, yeah, that's all there is to really say about it. I don't have the dongle, so I can't use it. But in case anyone has a dongle, they're thinking of sending it in. Don't worry, there's no need for that actually. I never, ever, ever use Firewire. I don't even have anything that uses it left. I had a little camcorder. I got rid of that ages ago. And in my bench machine that's sitting right above here where the camera is, I actually have a Firewire card in there. So for the rare times I do need to transfer something over Firewire, like from a hard drive or something, I just use my bench machine there. And then this here is an IBM 3270 emulation card, credit card adapter. <laughs> credit card adapter, really? Um, it does use a dongle as well, which I don't have, so, but I also don't have a 3270 to plug into anyways. And apparently this card complies with FCC rules and it's assembled in Canada. Part number 0933299. There is a serial number. Oh, and it says fourth quarter, 1993. So that's when this card is from. I absolutely love this graphics on here. It's so 90s in such an awesome and cool way. Depending on when this video comes out, I have a video about the 5170, IBM 5170. And in that was an ethernet looking card, had a coax jack on it. And several of my patrons commented to say that that was actually a 3270 interface card. So I'm wondering if perhaps the dongle that goes with this goes from this little thin connection to that coax type connection for connection to IBM's mainframe. Hmm. Anyhow, Shane, thank you very much for sending in these cards, but more importantly, all of those Kiwi awesome New Zealand sweets and chips or crisps and all that stuff. Um, I haven't shown that on a video yet, but I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to do this candy review thing on the second channel. So I'll get to that eventually, but um, that stuff is still ready to be tasted. I have a package here from Brett in Beaver Creek, Ohio. Hi to all my Ohio viewers. Let's see what do we have here. Something heavy in a bag. No note that I saw, but I do remember talking to Brett via email. So, sold as is, 99 cents at the Salvation Army. It's a Tandy, it's a Tandy PS2 mouse. Poor thing was down to 99 cents, sold as is, either June 15th or June 2015. Can't quite tell, but there it is. Very standard run of the mill. Tandy mouse. Oh, it's a serial and PS2 combo mouse. It's always useful to have extra of those. Thank you very much. 
I'd say we have some interface cards for the Apple II. So we have a Practical Peripherals printer card with a capital PR, probably because uh, you put this into slot one and it becomes PR number one, as is this one. We have a Grappler Plus, also an Apple II printer interface card. And we have another one here. We have another Grappler Plus card. So all my Apple IIs are gonna have full-on printing capabilities with parallel printers. So three of those and something in here. Uh, this is a bag from Micro Center. I'm kind of jealous. We don't have Micro Centers here in Oregon, at least where I live. It's a great computer store. Now that Fry's Electronics has gone out of business. Oh yes, okay, I remember talking to Brett. He had a huge bag full of the original IBM branded keys for the IBM 5170. Look at all of these, so many of them. And I have to wonder like how many of these are different. Do not duplicate IBM. All right, so another thing he sent is there seems to be a bag full of like lock parts, probably for the back of one of these locks. I think this swings up and actually physically locks the top case in place. So you can't pull the case off even if you take the screws out. But the other thing that's in here is these look like the covers that go on the back of, I think an Apple IIe, although it's hard to tell, but the little port covers, maybe? Anyhow, all right, Brett, thank you very much. Uh, let's take a quick look at this stuff on the bench. All right, so stuff from Brett here. Got several Apple II printer cards, right? So practical peripherals, I had a modem made by them back in the day. But this is obviously a printer face card. Cute pun there. Made in USA, copyright 1993. And then the next card is this one here, which has a cable, which is does disconnect, but on the end of it has the Centronics parallel port connection. And this is the Grappler Plus, which has got to be one of the most, well, famous or common Apple II cards. Orange Micro was the company that made this. Pretty sure that when I was a kid in our Apple II Plus, we had a Grappler Plus. 1982 on the sticker for the EEPROM. There's just not a whole lot going on in these cards. I'm pretty sure that it just uses like a latch or something like that to kind of latch the, the parallel data onto the cable. And if you compare these two, well, the Grappler one has a little bit more, a few more chips on it for whatever reason. But I think these are all relatively simple or common. Now the weird thing is, is when I had an Apple II, I had that two plus as a kid growing up, but then I had a 2C and a 2GS and then Max, and none of those had parallel interfaces. So I always had a serial printer, which was like the original image writer and then the image writer too. Later on I had PCs and with those, of course I had parallel printers. Although I think I used to use my image writer on the PC as well through a cable to the serial port. I hated the Image Writer. It was not a printer I really liked that much. It was so loud, so slow, and just it jammed all the time, at least for me. Maybe something was wrong with it, I don't know. But I was always a little bit jealous of my friends who had like Panasonic printers or Epson's that just seemed to work a lot more reliably than the Image Writer. And in this bag here, there's another Grappler Plus. Looks pretty much the same as, um, as this one here. And yes, if you're not familiar with the Apple II line, so this cable plugs into the card and literally this ribbon cable just hangs out the back of your computer. Completely not FCC approved, shielded in any way. And you know, these cards were being sold like this way into the, into the 80s. So um, yeah, that's just what the small companies were able to get away with, I guess. Now it was on PCs where parallel port devices that actually had bi-directional capability were very common. Think zip drives, external CD-ROMs, external floppy drives. I have no idea if these parallel ports have any type of capability for bi-directional transfers that way. I don't think necessarily they do. There's obviously a little bit of signaling that comes back from the printer to the computer through the card, like for online and ready and stuff like that and paper out but I'm not sure if all eight bits are available for reverse transfers. And speaking of PCs, here are those keys that were for the IBM 5170 that he sent me. Now look at this, these were like in a key box or something because they have 
tags on them with numbers 47. I guess an office was just filled with 5170s at, at some point. And uh, these are the IBM keys. Now you wouldn't necessarily need these for normal operation of your computer unless you lock the machine at night so that uh, someone couldn't turn it on and use it. When you lock the key lock on the front of the 5170, it not only disables your keyboard, so you can't type anymore, but it actually has a physical thing that kind of latches onto the front of the case, which does prevent you from opening the lid. Now, I'm sure you could break it off. It's just held on with like plastic and stuff, but it would stop the casual opening of a machine. Now, unfortunately for me, is IBM actually used actual lock cylinders that aren't just like one key for every machine. Uh, there's actually, how many tumblers here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven, well, tumblers, or I don't know, whatever, little positions here on, around the key are, you know what, maybe it's not seven, actually. It looks like one of them is, oh, no, no, it's different on this one. I was like, they look the same. So there are seven little, I don't know, I'm gonna call them tumblers because that's what I know from a regular lock. I don't know much about these cylindrical locks. But either way, you push this in and you try to turn it and it doesn't necessarily work. If you have the wrong key, that is. Now, I tried all of these keys on my 5170 on the, uh, the old one with the broken front. But what I haven't done is try these on the new 5170 that I've been working on uh, for main channel Saturday videos. So let me give that a quick try. So this is the lock on the front of the computer, and this is plastic, this whole part here that holds the lock, so that's why I said it's not super strong. But there is a little piece here that when you lock it, it comes up here, and I think that engages with something on the front cover that would keep you from opening it. Now, I'm not going to hold out any hope that any of these are going to work, and that's really because IBM, you know, they didn't um, cheap out uh, like a lot of the clone cases where those keys were basically just like, you know, generic key, you could use one key in anything. I remember that from back in the day. Um, there was definitely, you could just try them and they would work. So IBM, props to you for using a real key. Now while I try these, I was just thinking back to lock picking lawyer videos. I think these are called wafer locks. Is that right? So when you push this in, there are like little wafer things in the cylinder that move into position that then allow it to turn. Anyhow, that was the last key. None of them worked on this machine either. And I had already tried it on that machine back there and none of these worked there either. And back on the bench here, there was one more thing that Brett sent. And it was this stuff here. Now, what what are these? I don't know what these are. They're like a little tool of some kind. Oh, there's an Apple logo on the back of them. Does anyone know what these are for? There's a whole bunch of them here. And they have the Apple logo. And it's metal. And I just don't have a clue. Don't know what these are for. But these things here, these appear to be the back cover for the Apple IIe, for the ports, I think. I'm not even sure about that though either. They're all exactly the same size. The IIe has a whole assortment of sizes on the back. Unfortunately, my IIe is kind of stored away um, in the basement here, but out of easy reach, so I can't just take, quickly take a look. But I think these are covers that, yeah, you can pop off to have uh, like a 25 pin connector, for instance, and then you can pop this back in as the cover or whatnot. So I'm assuming that's what these are, but I wonder what these um, metal things have to do with it. If anyone has thoughts, please let me know in the description or in the comment section below. And here is the Combi Mouse. I love it, sold as is, 99 cents. And probably if this were in a thrift store today, it'd probably also be 99 cents. Now, PS2 and serial. Oh, let's just check out the back. Radio Shack, custom manufacturer in Taiwan, Republic of China, for Radio Shack, a division of Tandy Corporation, Fort Worth, Texas. PS2 and Microsoft compatible, fast and accurate cursor movement, 
two button operation includes the serial to PS2 adapter, ideal for Deskmate, Windows, and many other graphics programs for Tandy and other PC compatible computers with PS2 mouse and or serial ports. And on the other side, the other flap, exactly the same thing. Cat number 25-2001. Well, let's just take a close up look at this. It's still in its original plastic. Wonder if this thing was ever actually used. No, I don't think it ever was. So there's the serial to the PS2 adapter. Now keep in mind, there's not actually electronics inside this adapter. It's just that this mouse sends both the PS2 and the serial connections or serial signals over the same connector. So either this shorts a pin on here that lets the mouse know to run in PS2 mode, but I doubt that. I have a feeling it's just a couple of the unused pins on here have the capability to transmit the PS2 signal. Anyhow, this mouse is definitely brand new, unused, doesn't have any yellowing on it. It says Tandy in white lettering there. It's a relatively cheap mouse. I can't imagine this was expensive when it was new. The Combi mouse in the same cat number, 25-2001. You have four Teflon pads there, ooh, fancy. And of course, this is a normal ball mouse. So we can uh, pop that out. Actually, the ball is a little sort of, I don't know, it's gonna, not gonna come across in the camera. It's, it's definitely a little degraded, the rubber. It's still, it's not sticky or anything, and I think it should work. But actually, this mouse ball is very light. I think it's plastic filled. Um, typically, these mouse balls are, well, not typically, but back in the day, the good quality mice, it was metal, so it was kind of hefty and it would give really good traction on your desk or whatever, uh, this light plastic ball may not work as well. But if you look in there, I don't think it's coming across because of the lighting, but the wheels in there are 100% clean, which would imply, like I said, that this mouse is absolutely brand spanking new. Okay, and I just gave this a quick test on a computer and it, of course, totally works. Well, you know, on a serial computer at least, I'm, I'm assuming it would work fine on PS2 as well. So cool, neat stuff, Brett. Thank you very much for sending this stuff in. And with that, we're gonna end this mail call video here. I wanna thank everyone who has sent in stuff to mail call on this episode and all the past episodes and of course, all the future episodes. And I'd like to thank all my patrons whose names are scrolling up the side of the screen. If you'd like to become a patron, there's a link in the description below. You'll get early access to videos and also a much easier way to reach out to me. Unfortunately, my, my channel email has so many messages in it, it's really, really hard for me to keep up between making videos and my day job and just trying to juggle everything. So it's really a better way to get a hold of me if you're a patron through the Patreon messaging system. And then also put your comments down below and subscribe and thumbs up if you like this video and thumbs down if you didn't and all that usual stuff. And check out my second channel, Adrian's Digital Basement 2, for stuff like uh, the candy reviews and the stuff I got from Shane. I'm gonna try to make a video <laughs> where I taste that stuff. I keep talking about that and I, I haven't done it yet. So um, anyhow. That's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.